The magic of the STL is, the, the brilliant idea they had is, let's make iterators provide a uniform interface for the containers, um, uh, for the algorithms. And so uh, every algorithm sees the same interface independent of whether they're talking to a list or a deck or you know, a set, doesn't matter. They see the same interface through those, uh, through those iterators. And that's why uh, the algorithms aren't passed to container, they're passed iterators. They're passed to begin iterator and end iterator, and they just use that common interface. Works like a charm. Really, really good idea. And, you know, <clears throat> that idea of providing a uniform interface to a variety of things is a great, great idea. And you say, gee, that's just, well, of course, that's just design, man, that's just business as usual. That's what we do. You know, we know we have, well, when the SDL was invented, that probably wasn't the case. It wasn't, oh, everybody knows that, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I suspect, it's long enough ago that I don't remember, but I suspect that um, when the, uh, the SDL was the first really significant application of that idea. And now everybody's used to the SDL, and so they say, oh, of course. But it was the SDL that really made that so obviously right. You know, and that applies to a bunch of things. I've, I've talked about in the uh, demo I gave you, I had that navigator, you know, which is displaying files and uh, directories and files. And, uh, you know, one of your colleagues uh, was unhappy with that. He said, gee, you know, I, sh I shouldn't, you know, my client shouldn't have to know about directories and files and stuff. I'm not sure I completely agree with that, but the idea is suppose instead of having our navigator uh, accept files and uh, directories, suppose it accepted groups and elements of groups. So for a file view, for a directory view, that the groups would be directories and the elements would be files. But for a category, the groups would be categories and the elements would be files in those categories. Or for namespaces, the groups would be namespaces, and the elements would be files in those namespaces, okay? So now, all of a sudden, we have, but doing nothing, we have these really nice several different views, and I think actually providing all three of those views would be a really great idea for a repository. Okay, so. Thank you, TNU, for, he was unhappy with me, and I'm glad he was, because it got me thinking about it a little bit. I think making that provider view would be a really good idea. And notice, it's the same idea. Let's just make, to that display, he's using the same interface to talk to files and directories and files, or categories and, you know, whatever. Whatever the view is you want to, but you see that structure. Okay. So, uh, the iterators, I have a little example from the code snips for uh, the, if we get past the title stuff, uh, a trim function, it just removes leading white space and trailing white space, uh, and a split that splits a, a string into an array of substrings based on some delimiter. And these are just using, these aren't using algorithms. I could have used algorithms. And had I thought about this lecture, I would have used algorithms here, <laughs> okay. But uh, you can see me using the iterators. I'm just using iterators to iterate through the strings. And the reason that works is that a string is a container. It's an STL container. It has all the properties that a container has to have, and we'll talk about that toward the end of the lecture. What does that mean? <clears throat> So with that, let's uh, look at this STL presentation. <coughs> so 
Uh, the SDL divides its containers up into two classes, standard sequence containers and standard associative containers. Uh, I think the set and multi-set are kind of halfway in between. The associative containers, the mental model is you've got a key value. And with each key, you associate a value. That's why it's called associative containers. Uh, the set doesn't have a key and value, it just has values or, or, or take your pick, it just has keys, but it doesn't, it doesn't have two things, so it's relating. Uh, but nevertheless, they're, they're classified as associative containers because they have underlying them a data structure. In the case of sets and maps and uh, multi-sets and multi-maps, that's a binary search tree, red-black, happens to use a red-black balancing algorithm. Um, but, uh, and so you get an ordered view of the components. The uh, unordered multi-set, uh, unordered set and map and multi-set and multi-map are based on the, uh, on a hash table. And so you don't get a, a hash view, but you get this quick lookup. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, the reason that sets and multisets are in this, and, and unordered sets and unordered multisets are in this category, is that they're really based on uh, either a red black tree or hash table, even though there is no real association. Okay, and iterators, there are several flavors of iterators. There are input iterators and output iterators. The only place that I've seen input and output iterators used is with streams. And I showed you an example really quick a few days ago, a few lectures ago. Forward iterators, uh, for a long time, there was no container in the STL that provided forward iterators, but now there's a singly linked list, and that does. As of C11, they have a singly linked list, and now uh, uh, that uses forward iterators only. Um, I've never used a single link list. I got so used to using lists, and list is easy and simple, and so I just use list. Bidirectional iterators move backwards and forwards. Uh, uh, so a doubly, for example, a doubly linked list, the list, this doubly linked list, uh, would use a bidirectional iterator. And random access iterators are iterators that um, work uh, for containers with contiguous memory so that I can take that, the address that that iterator is wrapping, and I can add n to it and point to the, uh, an element n away. Uh, and that's, you know, the vector and the deck and, and so on use random access iterators. Uh, and the other thing, so we have containers, we have iterators, we have algorithms, and those algorithms are all uh, based on the use of functors, function objects. Either function pointer, functor, or lambda. And the algorithms typically will take a start iterator and end iterator that defines the range that we're going to talk to, and a function object that is applied to each element in that range. Okay, and so uh, notice two things. One is that um, the algorithm doesn't care what the underlying uh, container is because it just has a start iterator and end iterator, and it's just using that uniform interface to step across it, so it works for any. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, you don't have to operate on the whole container. You can operate on any segment of it without doing anything to the algorithm, you just give it a different start. If I want to start two up from the first one, I just say plus, 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 and then I use that iterator as the, as the beginning iterator. Okay. <clears throat> STL uh, was very carefully designed to support uh, the uh, guaranteed complexity, uh, it provides complexity guarantees uh, for operations. Uh, so for uh, vectors and decks, contiguous. Insertion is a linear time operation because when we insert, we gotta go, we gotta 
move, we got to go to the end one, move it up one, move it up one, move it up one, move it to make space. So we have this linear slide, okay, to make space for that uh, uh, new element. Accessing a known lo location is constant time. Searching an unsorted vector or deck is linear time. We just got to go over each one. Uh, searching a sorted vector or deck should be a logarithmic time operation. This, the reason I say should be is that uh, that only works if I use binary search on it. But there is a global algorithm called find, and find is linear whether I've sorted that container or not. Okay. Also, uh, uh, we'll see uh, for sets and maps, for example, uh, these are uh, uh, fine should be a logarithmic operation because it's a binary search tree, you know, so it definitely should be logarithmic. But if you use this global find, it's just going to take the beginner and step over each element. So guess what? You've, you've made it linear. But those uh, containers that support fast searches have their own member find. So the moral of the story is when you're using a container, if you're not sure, look at the container interface. You know, IntelliSense does a nice job. You write dot F-I-N-D, and if it doesn't know it, then, then you use standard find, okay? And you, you just say standard find and insert uh, begin iterator and end iterator. So, so, uh, <coughs> So for vectors and decks, insertion is linear, accessing is constant time, searching unsorted uh, is linear, searching a sorted will be uh, 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 logarithmic uh, if we use binary search. Lists, insertion is a constant time uh, operation if we know where we want to, you know, if we have an iterator there at that location and we say insert, it's constant time. If we, the, the, typically that's at either end. We know, you know, the, the doubly linked list g gives you a reference to the beginning and to the end, and so you can either A to the front or A to the back in constant time. Push, push front, push back are constant time operations. But, uh, but uh, if you don't know, you know, where that location is, then it's got to be linear time because uh, you, have to, you have to visit each node to get a pointer to the next node to the pointer to the next node to the pointer to the next node. Sets and maps are based on a red-black binary tree. Uh, I assume there's some performance advantage, probably worst case performance advantage to red-black. Red-black is a little more complicated than AVL. So why they didn't, you know, I assume that they use red-black instead of AVL because uh, there's, you know, better worst case performance or something. Uh, but in any case, they use red black. Uh, insertion and accessing are linear time operations. Uh, 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 searching should be logarithmic time. Again, use the member function find to ensure that it is. Don't use global find. <coughs> An unordered set and unordered map <coughs> Based on a hash table, lookup, insertion, and deletion are nearly constant time operations. So the address of the hash table is computed with a hash function, that's constant time, but now we gotta walk up a bucket list. That walking up the list is linear, but you know, the, the uh, memory allocation scheme tries to keep uh, all of those lists very, very short. So that's why it's nearly constant time. If you have a bad hash algorithm, a bad hash algorithm can turn finds into linear. Just because, you know, a lot of the buckets are small, but some of them are huge, okay? Just because you don't have uniform distribution of the hash addresses. <coughs> okay. So access is nearly constant time. Uh, here's uh, header files for the containers. 
uh, I have listed the include statement. You know, I didn't put the pound include, but and then the type that you'll get. And uh, a few comments about it, you know, like list, doubly linked list, fast insert, erase the current location, and either end, slow traversal. Here, slow means linear. You know, outside of the STL, nothing in the STL is going to be worse, if you use it correctly, uh, nothing is going to be worse than linear. Okay. But normally when we say slow, we're talking about... Uh, uh, complexity, square law complexity, or some exponential <laughs> complexity, you know. But uh, in the context of the STL, slow just means it's linear instead of log or constant time. Uh, map, uh, so in map you get map and multi-map, in Q you get Q and priority Q, and set you get set and multi-set, and stack you get stack, so on an unordered map, you get unordered map and unordered multi-map. I don't use the multi-sets and multi-maps much. Uh, they allow you to have uh, duplicate keys, but usually that makes it your life harder, not easier, uh, because uh, now a key gives you a collection of things rather than one thing, and now you've got to search through the collection of things. So you've got two, two kinds of searches. You, you have the hash search, and now you've got to search through what it returns. Okay. So I don't think I ever worked on a design where I really needed a multi-set or multi-map. I'm sure there are a few, but... Uh, anytime I uh, am tempted to use multi-set or multi-map, I ask myself, what's wrong with this design? Why do I need to do this? And usually there's an answer to that. There is something wrong with the design. <coughs> okay. So anyway, that's kind of a summary. Of this, you know, not exhaustive, but it's a summary of the ones we use most of the time. There's other headers, and again, this isn't exhaustive. If you go to the cppreference.com, they give you exhaustive lists of these header files. But <clears throat> algorithm, so, you know, my degrees are all electrical engineering. To me, an algorithm means the fast Fourier transform or or uh, uh, image processing algorithm, you know, pattern matching algorithm, an optimization algorithm, you know, steepest descent, conjugate grade. Those are algorithms. That's not what these are. These are computational operations, each one of them. And, you know, find, find if, search. So find if says, uh, you know, here's a find if. Begin iterator, end, iter end iter uh, uh, iterator, and a function object that's telling it what to find. And so it's applying it to it. And so the model is, you don't need to write loops anymore, just use find it. Now I've got to say, it's quicker for me to write the loop than it is to go and look up the algorithm that I want to use. Okay, So I write the loops, I do. But there are a few cases where they really make sense, and I'm going to show you one this morning. Okay. I think it's good for you to know what's there, and then you have a choice. If you don't know what's there, you don't have a choice. But if you know what's there, now you have a choice. Yes, you'll. On the find function. Yep. Uh, you can use a lambda function to yeah. evaluate the Almost function. all of these, I think all of them take... A, call, a callable object. Okay. The typical model is beginning iterator and iterator to find a, a range and then a functor to apply it to. Okay. You need to read the fine details. There's a few of them that don't want you to modify the contents. They don't do the right thing if you modify the contents. So there are non-modifying operations and it's you're evil if you attempt to modify it with your functor, but, but there are lots of them that, that allow modifying. Non-modifying functions, they accept uh, a constant iterator rather than an iterator. Uh, I hope that's the case, but I don't, I know it didn't used to be the case because I could, <laughs> I have <laughs> cases where I, in ignorance, modified the container and got wrong results. And look, But I suspect that now they've cleaned all that up and, you know, but I haven't tried it. Why don't you try it for us and tell us, uh, you know, 
on Tuesday, you can tell us what you found. Sure. Ideally, it would fail to compile. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, and functional, it has our standard function and bind. Uh, there is a traditional bind one and bind two, uh, which have been superseded by bind. I've got some examples coming up, and I'll, ha you know, I have an example of bind one and bind two, and that now is that's kind of deprecated. You really should use be using bind. I just haven't gotten the slides updated, but uh, <clears throat> bind typically uh, you'll turn a. Uh, binary function into a unary function with bind. That's a typical application. So uh, I could, uh, if I have a comparison operation, I can turn that to, into a threshold by binding one of the arguments to a constant value, the threshold value. Okay? And now it just compares against the threshold instead of comparing two things. That's the kind of thing that bind does. Not the only, you know, but that's a lot of its uses for, uh, for that kind of thing. Uh, there's an iterator class, and you typically don't need to use this. Um, you've seen me, for example, on the NoSQL database. Uh, you can supply, you can use the uh, many of the algorithms on my NoSQL database, uh, and my NoSQL database has an iterator, but I didn't need to include uh, uh, the iterator header file because. I was just stealing the underlying iterator. My NoSQL iterator, I have using uh, iterator equals standard uh, unordered map of key value type colon colon iterator. I'm just stealing its iterator. So that unordered map needed to include this, but I don't because I'm just stealing its iterator. But if I'm building my own, I showed you when we first started talking about templates, I did a fairly quick walk through a, temp, uh, a hash table design I had done. I had to include uh, this because I didn't have an underlying uh, iterator that I was using. I was using my own, building my own. And what this gives you basically are some definitions of basic operations, but also a whole bunch of traits. The most important thing is that this gives you a bunch of traits, all the traits that an iterator should supply. Remember that a trait is a universal name for a type that will be instantiated by the application, and when you're writing this code, you don't know how, you, you, this isn't how, you're in the library, or you're building a function that the application is going to use, and you don't know how the application is going to instantiate it, so you need that, you need that universal name. Uh, I'll come back to that point, we'll look at it a little bit. Uh, the memory uh, includes unique pointer, shared pointer, and uh, there's uh, mechanics to define your own allocators. If you were building a CAD system, you might, for example, in some kinds of CAD systems, you might have thousands of objects all of the same size. And so you could elect to build your own allocator based on an array of those fixed size objects, and that would be a lot faster. Because the, the, the generic allocator is using the memory manager, which is a linked list of memory slots, okay, memory allocations. And uh, so, you know, you might well choose to uh, uh, provide your own. The second required text, which most, which most of you didn't buy, Joe Sudis, you should have bought, okay, because he's really good, does a nice, nice, very tutorial description, really nice. He shows you how to define your own allocator. Really nice illustration. So, uh, numeric again, you know, as an electrical engineer, this doesn't have what I expected it to have. Okay, the first time I looked at it, but what it does have: accumulate, a partial sum, these kinds of <laughs> things. They're really there to help you control. Uh, loss of significance. Signal processing algorithms especially tend to be ill-conditioned. They tend to be, you know, very commonly subtracting two very large numbers that are very close together, two large numbers to get a little small number. Really easy to lose all the significance, you know. So you say, these two are the same, but they're not the same. Okay. Uh, you have a something that has, you know, 23 bits of significance, 
and you're holding it in a 16-bit uh, you know, uh, uh, value, and you know, you've lost when you subtract. You, you can perfectly well get zero when things aren't zero. So. so that's what these do. These use larger underlying stores than the type that you would expect. Utility, you almost never have to include because it's included by almost all the other headers. Uh, pair is there, so if you're using uh, either the, the sets, a set or a map or multi-set or uh, set or a map or an unordered set or unordered map, you got pair because they included utility. So. Okay. Uh, iterators. <coughs> <coughs> Input iterator for streams, used for streams. Uh, output iterator, uh, so input iterators read only, move forward. Output iterators write only, move forward. And O stream and I stream, and I gave you the example of that. <coughs> There's also <coughs> a front inserter and back inserter iterators that are really useful. So the, I don't know that I've given you an example. I, th I may have, but uh, my stream example might have used uh, inserters. I've forgotten. Uh, forward iterators read and write, move forward. Bidirectional iterators read and write, forward and backward. Random access read and write, and you can add n or plus equals n or whatever, and jump to. And so the C++ pointers, vector, and deck, the bidirectional lists, uh, set, multi-set, map, and multi-map, and so on. Forward iterator, for a long time, there's nothing in the STL that used a forward iterator, but now that there is a single list, as of C++ 11, there's a single list, singly, singly linked list, and that uses a forward iterator. Uh, <coughs> so the STL uh, expects you to use function objects which could be functions, could be functors, could be lambdas. And uh, we talk about unary functions or unary callable objects. Just means it takes a single argument. Uh, and here, uh, so I've defined a unary function print element. And now I can, I can print out the entire con uh, container or any subrange of the container for each li begin, li end, print element is just applied to every element of the container. And as long as this is a template function, then great, I'm all set. Don't have to do a thing. Type inference gets it all to compile the way it should. And predicates are uh, function objects that return a bool, you know, is positive and so on. Uh, return location of the first positive value, you know. Blah, blah, blah. Now, uh, this just talks about function objects, functors. We know all about that. You know, it's a, a class that has any, uh, any class that implements operator paren is a functor. Function uh, generates a function object. Uh, unary function type. Now, what's going on here is that this is a uh, template that defines, all it does is define, and these days it would be, uh, uh, you know, this was written before there was the alias uh, using. So instead of saying using argument type equals arg, you know, now th this was written before then, so type def arg, arg, arg type. But what's happening here is, Arg, uh, arg might be a string or an integer or whatever, and we don't know what it is until the application instantiates it, but I may be writing this function to apply to any of those. I don't know what it is. So I need a common way of declaring that, and this just says you can always use argument type. If this is a string, argument type is a string. If this is an int, argument type is an int. So we always can use argument type and result type in our function. And you know the compiler will set it to the right thing as it instantiates the template. Now, why that might be useful for you is 
<coughs> the STL provides adapters. So here, uh, there's an adapter, not one, takes a unary function <coughs> predicate and negates it, not two, takes a binary function predicate and negates it, but this only works if your unary function has, to, uh, has derived from unary function, because it's using argument type and result type internally. So, uh, so here I say, uh, list in iterator iter equal find if li begin li n positive, fine, uh, uh, positive can be any old thing, but now in order for me to say not one positive, the first non-positive value, not one positive, this will only work if positive inherits from unary function, unary function. Won't work otherwise because not one is using argument type and, and result type. Not using result type because the result is Boolean, okay, but, but it's using the argument type. So uh, <clears throat> if you want your, you know, your um, callable objects that you define, your unary and binary callable objects that you define, if you want them to work with these adapters like not and plus and so on, then you simply derive from unary type. And all that does is provide the, the names, and now you use those names internally in your class, in your callable object. Okay, binary function type uh, is uh, now, you know, surprise, surprise, has an arg1 first argument type, arg2, second argument type, result, result type. And so the adapters use these names. Your, your function code uses those names, and everything's hun hunky-dory. Yeah? On the previous slide, uh, when you give or find if positive, what's the Oh, this will work. Uh, this will work with or w whether I derive from unary function or not. Doesn't we need to give a type t? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, see, this is templated. So, what's going to happen is this is automatically, that the uh, template type inference sets t to be whatever the value type is of this container. Okay. So, there's a lot of type inferencing going on in templates. But this doesn't work. Uh, so, this will work whether, whether I derive from unary function or not. But this won't unless I derive from unary function and use those names internally. Binary type, you know, takes two arguments and returns a result and so on. Binders, now uh, here's my example. I'm using bind one and bind two. These are kind of deprecated. All we really need is bind. Bind was generalized a little bit. And so, uh, but, you know, this is just an example of I'm, I'm turning. Uh, a greater into a threshold. Instead of saying greater between two values, now I say greater with the value and five. So now my threshold is five, or whatever I wanted to, you know, value I wanted to give it. So it's typical of the way binds are used. Uh, here's a little, not complete, just a kind of a quick view of a lot of the stuff that's there. The STL provides a whole bunch of function objects, arithmetic functions, comparison functions, logical functions. Uh, and again, their model is that, you know, a lot of this low, a lot of this basic stuff, use an ST algorithm to, you know, to do it. And, I, and again, I don't do that, okay? It takes me longer to figure out which, which thing I'm supposed to use than just to write the little code, okay? But again, there are cases, I'm going to show you one in just a couple of minutes, there are cases where it's really useful to use them. Uh, there's a bunch of types of uh, algorithms. So again, this is an exhaustive list, compare, there's equal lexicographic compare, you know, and so on. Copy, copy, copy backward, heap operations, initialization. These can be useful, uh, for example, when you are writing uh, test, uh, test functions. 
uh, it can be useful to generate a container with a certain set of values. And maybe I want to test a message processing system, so I want to drive it with a bunch of different kinds of messages. Okay. So I could have my generator randomly pick a message type out of this set of five, okay? And now it just it fills up my container with uh, my test container with random, those five messages re selected randomly, okay? So it can be useful for that, uh, that kind of stuff. Merge, min, max, permutations, remove. So uh, I'm going to talk about remove in a little bit. Uh, scanning algorithms, search algorithms, set operations, sorting, swap, transformations, lots and lots and lots of uh, algorithms, types. And uh, uh, at the end of the class, I'll talk a little bit about uh, <clears throat> places you can look to get a little more, you know, fairly gentle help with them. I want to start now, I want to go to this example, invalid iterators. <clears throat> so, what I'm doing in this example, <clears throat> something quite simple. I have <coughs> I have a vector of integers, okay, my collection is standard vector of int, and there's some zeros in it, and I want to remove the zeros. That's all I want to do. And so let's do the obvious thing. So iter iter for iter equal begin collection, iterator not equal to end collection, plus plus iter. If contents of iter equals zero, zero. Uh, collection dot erase. Oh, obvious, of course. That works just fine. So let's run it. Not going to work. Shh. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> what happened? What happened is. Anytime you move data under an iterator, it becomes invalid wisely. If they didn't do that, then you know, you're working away, you have these iterators, and you just remove something here, data slides under this iterator, and now you use it like it was that thing you used to point to, but you're not pointing to it anymore, you're pointing to the next one up. So wisely they invalidate it, and they force that abort. So let's fix that. So now here, collection equals master, uh, iter, iter, temp it. For iter equal begin collection, iter not equal to end collection plus plus temp it equals iter, save it, uh, temp it equals zero. So the naive assumption is, you know, I am, uh, I am uh, erasing temp it, so temp it becomes invalid. But you know what's going to happen, okay? So let's run it. I mean, you can see, don't, don't peek ahead in my comments. So just, you know, just, bam! And of course, I didn't do anything. All I did was obfuscate the fact that, you know, Tempid is just another name for that iterator. You know, essentially, that iterator is still invalid. So, okay, let's fix this. Doggone it, let's fix this. Okay. So now, <coughs> collection master iter equal begin collection, while iter not equal to end collection, contents of iter equals zero. Now what I've done 
is it or went invalid as soon as I did this erase, but I replaced it by the iterator that erase returns. So that old iterator went away. That invalid iterator I copied over with a valid iterator that's returned by erase. So this will work. Okay. So let's run it. Boy, would I be embarrassed if it didn't work. <laughs> Occasionally my demos go that way, but I <laughs> usually. So it works. But look at what I did. Oh, look at what I did. I took something that is obviously should be order n. I'm just going up and removing the zeros. That obviously should be order n, but it's now order n squared. Why is it order n squared? Because I'm going around an order n loop, and I am calling, an, for each element, I'm calling an order n function, erase. Obviously, now n squared. That's a great question for an interview, OK? <laughs> What's the complexity of this up? Why do you say that? So now, let's fix that. Let's fix it. Let's fix that. You know, it'll, that one worked, but it didn't work as efficiently as it should. Let's make it efficient. So the idea here is now I'm going to have two pointers. When I hit a zero, I copy that element down, and now my lead pointer is one element away. I walk up, hit a zero, I copy that element down, now it's two away. Okay, and so I can get that. What I'm really doing is compacting that collection as I go. I just keep copying the, the, the next non-zero element into that. Next non-zero element, next non-zero element. When I hit a zero, I got it. I increment. Okay, so now absolutely linear. Works like a charm. OK, efficient, but it took three attempts. So enter, guess what, algorithms. So here. Now what we're doing is exactly, this code does exactly what the last code we looked at did. It works exactly the same way. But now what we're doing is, OK, <clears throat> standard remove, begin collection, end collection, zero. Remove doesn't remove anything. Remove does exactly what we did in this loop. It compresses. Why they didn't call it compresses beyond me. They called it remove. Remove doesn't remove anything. It compresses. But we compress it, and then we, re we erase the junk. You know, when we're copying stuff down, there's junk left at the end. If there are five zeros, there's going to be five junk items there, items that don't belong in that collection. Okay, And so we have to erase them just to get the container size down where it ought to be. Okay. So, uh, so now, uh, junk start equals standard remove. So what remove does is, when it finishes, it returns an iterator pointing to the next element after the compression zone. That's where the junk starts. And so now we say, collection.erase junk start to end. And notice, what we could say here clearly is, Collection.erase, standard remove, begin collection, end collection, comma, end collection. One line, we did it. Probably this is better because it's obvious, immediately obvious what you're doing. Uh, if you put it in one line, it takes that extra 30 seconds of CPU cycles to, uh, CPU cycles to, you know, at least it does for me. So, but anyway, uh, so what's happening here is the algorithms have thought through these problems 
and given you the efficient solution. It would be very easy to miss the fact. You know, you're in the throes of writing code. You know, you're writing code like crazy. Bah, 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 bah. So easy to miss the fact that you've changed what should be a linear algorithm into an n-squared algorithm. So easy to do. So the algorithms are really good for that. They're carefully thought out, you know, and they're going to give you the most efficient behavior that they can. So again, you know, it's for uh, using iterators in a sequential container, I absolutely would use algorithms. It's the right thing to do. Uh, I tend not to, if I'm going to do a whole bunch of erasing and stuff like that, I'm more likely to use a list or so, you know, it depends on the performance issues and so on, a bunch of, a bunch of considerations. But, but here's, a, here's a case, very a good case for places where you might want to use, might think about using these STL algorithms. Really good for that. Okay. <clears throat> so notice, remove is one of those algorithms. It was one of the ones that was on my list. And so it takes a beginning iterator, an end iterator, and uh, in this particular case, in remove, I'm just passing it a value, but I could pass it a function that computed a value. Okay. Might well be. I might want to remove the first zero, and then remove the first one, and then remove the first two, and then remove the first three. Something like that. I don't know. Why would I ever do that? I don't know. Is a gen uh, a collection of iterators or a single iterator? Is a range? Junk, junk start. Junk start, that's a single iterator. So for example, if I have multiple zeros, what would happen then? If you what? Multiple zeros, for example, the first element is zero, the fifth element is zero. Uh, I had multiple zeros in my collection. Are you talking about multiple adjacent zeros? It won't affect this. It'll still work. So that erase will, will like, we need this. All this is doing is pointing to the first non the first element that isn't in the compression zone. Okay. And so what you want to do is erase from that junk start to the end. That's all. It's just the junk. You're just getting rid of the junk. You're, you're, you know, it compressed up, but the container is still the same size. You start out, if you have seven elements and four zeros, it should be three, but it's going to be seven. It'll be three valid ones, and then junk in the next four. So erase gets rid of those four and gives you a container with three elements in it. Okay? Other questions? Okay. Now, so <coughs> that was a little motivation for <coughs> using algorithms. Uh, I want to talk about a model that I have in my head for using the STL. Uh, as a kid, I loved to build things. You know, I had Tinker Toy sets when I was real small, and then when I got a little older, I had Erector sets and stuff, constantly building stuff. Uh, the SDL is a glorified Erector set. It lets you really quickly build stuff by plugging things together. I have a... Um, Find duplicate files with the help of the STL containers demo. Finding duplicates. Let's just run it. So what I have here is I am traversing you know, a depth first search traversal of a directory. And I am finding, let's go to the top. So uh, let's go to the top. So I have two paths on which I find dot .su. I have two paths in which I find algo1.cpp. I have a whole bunch of paths where I have build log met HTML because they were, you know, that's generated by the, and you'll find a lot of 
uh, .t logs and st so on. Okay. Uh, and you say, okay, that's simple. What's a big deal? So I just use fully qualified file names. Okay. And uh, searching for matches. But imagine that I have a directory, a single directory with 2,000 files in it. Now I have 2,000 fully qualified file names that I gotta search through. You know, those seven levels of directory stuff that I gotta search through. A lot of duplicated CPU cycles that I don't need to have to spend. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to say I want a path set. And guess what? This is a set of paths, strings. And I'm going to have a uh, uh, file collection, file name file names collection. Could be anything, could be a, doesn't matter, vector or something. But joining these, I have a map of, let's call this, so let's suppose I said using, let's just, let's just, instead of me writing on the board, let's just go look at it here. I'll say, <coughs> Using a file path equals standard string. Using file paths equal standard set of file paths. So this is a this is a set of file paths. No, that's a set of file paths. This is a set of file paths. And now this map is a file into a list of file paths. So what's happening for each file, I have an iterator pointing to each path on which you'll find that file. Cool. This has exactly the same redundancy as the original problem. But I've replaced some of those 200 character path names with a little tiny iterator. So I've saved memory footprint. And now my search just ha doesn't have to search uh, you know, the, all that. You know, I'm just searching in the directory. I'm not searching through a, a collection of the, the big long strings, OK? So uh, you know, I, um, I have a huge, one second, I'll be right with you. I have a huge configuration management problem. You all know. You've gone to, you know, gone to some directory, pulled out a file, it's out of date, OK? I have a terrible configuration management problem. And so I wrote this duplicate to help, help me solve that problem. Unfortunately, I don't use it enough, OK? And I first wrote it in a naive way. I was using fully qualified path names, and I ran it on my laptop, and it took, I don't know, 25 minutes to run. So I'm a pack rat. You know, when I buy a new machine, I, I copy over the network everything on my old machine into my new machine, whether or not it's current. And so, and I do that. New machine, next time I buy a new machine, same thing, next time I have a new machine. So I have this accumulation of crud, okay? So, uh, which is part of my configuration management problem. But, uh, so, uh, that's why it took so long. I have thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of directories on that laptop sitting right there. And all kinds of stuff in it. So. Uh, but when I went to this design, that went from 25 minutes to maybe three minutes, two minutes, one minute, some really fast. And this was, it was nothing. It, you know, 
Without the STL, you would probably spend a day getting that data structure to work right. With the STL, in five minutes, 10 minutes, it's working. Because I'm just, you know, plugging those parts together. You know, file paths is standard set of file path. Uh, path collection equals standard list of file paths iterator. Okay, just the connections. File name string, files, vector of file names, duplicate files, standard map of file name path collection, you know, and so, you know, here, here, you know, here's where I'm putting it together, and uh, almost no code, you know. Find, I'm using the, the file system class to find stuff. You know, there's very little code here. Not much code at all. Because of this, I can just plug things together with the STL. That should be your model. That's what the STL buys you. The ability to build any kind of data structure you might need just by plugging things together. Right? You had a question? Yeah. Uh, my question was like, so once you compile and everything, when you put it in a map or file of the iterator, so next time when you have a duplicate file, you can simply search the key and add it on the list? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So like, it will only uh, I find a file. If I find a file, what I do is, uh, if it if there's an uh, if there's an iterator for that. So if that uh, if that key is in my is in my map, then I just add it to the list of iterators. If it's not, I start a new list of iterators. That's all. Piece of cake. Right. All righty. That's the STL. That is the STL. That's what it's worth. Great stuff. Okay. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about this presentation. Uh, so this is intended to be, this is like a compressed spec. What I'm trying to do is show you exactly what you get with the STL. No, you know, not a lot of text, not a lot of hand-holding, just showing you exactly what you get. So every container allocates and manages its own storage, period. Type definition is common to all containers as a value type a reference, constant reference, iterator, constant iterator, reverse iterator, constant reverse iterator, difference type, size type. Every one of the containers has those types. And again, these are just aliases. These are names for a specific type. So iterator is C colon colon iterator, C stands for the container, is a stand-in for whatever. If, I, if my container is a list of strings, then this is an iterator for a list of strings. If my iterator is a vector of ints, this is an iterator for a vector of ints. So I have this universal name iterator that applies to every single one of those containers. Traits. Member functions common to all containers. So I have a <coughs> default constructor. I have a copy constructor. I have a, dis uh, a destructor. I have an assignment operator. Where did my assignment operator go? Oh, what do you mean it's not on this list? It has to be. Oh, yeah, right here. So, right in front of me. So, uh, what this says is that if my class has, holds uh, STL containers and primitive functions, I don't need to write copy constructor, assignment operator, or destructor. I do not need to, and I shouldn't. The compiler generated ones work just fine, thank you. <coughs> you know, and there's comparison operators and size of max size. Max size is interesting. Uh, Max size should give you 
the allocation, not the current count, but the allocation. What the Microsoft implementation returns is all of available memory. Okay? Because you could expand it to, you know, what you want to know is tell me, for gosh sakes, tell me how much you have allocated. I want to know if, you know, you know, maybe I will, you, you know, I'm trying to do some caching and I want to, I know I'm going to add 43 elements and I've only got capacity for 10, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do it here because I don't want to do it on that other time, you know, critical thread or something. So, I don't know why they did it, but that's just a fluke of the Microsoft implementation. Uh, sequence containers, vector list, uh, list and DEC. <coughs> Member functions common to all sequence containers. So uh, every one of them has a container that I can uh, 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 fill with n copies of type T of uh, this instance of the T type. Uh, and I can fill it with uh, a range from another container. And I can insert uh, uh, add an iterator this value, okay? So that makes sense for sequence containers. We're gonna, we'll see that we have a very similar one for associated containers, which seems odd, but we'll see that we do, and I'll talk about it a little bit. So, you know, some, this tells you, here's what would they do. Here's what you can expect from them. Invalidation of iterators, invalidation of iterators into vectors. You should basically, a safe strategy is to assume that any iterator into a vector becomes invalid after either uh, insertion or erasure. And you say, why does, suppose I have an iterator down below where I'm inserting, why would that, how could that make the iterator invalid? Let me ask you. I have an iterator down here, and above where the iterators point, I insert something. How could that possibly make this iterator invalid? Jessica. Yeah, you all. Uh, I think uh, the type of uh, object you're dealing with, if it's a vector or uh, a DQ, it might be different. Now, here's the deal. No. I gotta, you know, I gotta be type consistent. Let's assume that I'm not playing any funny games. So, I'm pointing down here, and I want to insert here, but my vector is full. So, it will silently go away and allocate this other memory over here, leaving my vector down there dangling off in invalid land. So the only safe thing to do is to assume that uh, uh, any iterator into a vector becomes invalid after either insertion or erasure, and the same thing is true of DEX. It's true of the contiguous memory containers. Now, uh, invalidation of iterators into the list, not going to be a problem because the list is made up of nodes that are linked together. They're not contiguous. Nothing gets moved around. You know, yeah, if I delete that one, that iterator, you know, if I erase that one, the iterator that I originally pointed to, but if I simply, you know, that erase is going to return an iterator, if I simply overwrite it, I'm good, good to go. I have no invalid iterators anywhere in sight. So, uh, the only place you really get in a problem with invalidation is in the contiguous containers. But you need to be aware that you do. You'll see me very often... Uh, iterating, indexing rather than iterating in sequential containers because indexes don't become invalid. Now, you know, I mean, that index three might not, no longer refer to the, you know, so you got to understand that. But, okay. Use of invalid iterators. The only safe things you can do with an invalid iterator is to reinitialize by assigning a new iterator value to it or destroy it. That's what you can do. And in my example, the, the fourth example in the invalidation of iterators, uh, that's what I, in the third example, that's what I was doing. Just overwriting it. 
Sorted associate containers, all are based on balanced red black tree. This is now out of date, shame on me. Uh, it's either based on red black trees or on hash tables. The unordered map, and, unordered, and I probably just need to make another category here for that. But anyway, uh, types common to all the sorted, sorted associative uh, containers are key type, key <coughs> compare, and value compare. And they all will have, the, all the containers have a value type, so they don't, have to, they don't have to reiterate it here. We know that all the containers have a value type. So the associative containers have both a key type and a value type, and a key compare, value compare. Uh, invalidation of iterators with associated containers, not a problem. Member functions common to all the sorted associative containers. <coughs> so, uh, you know, as before, I have a default constructor, copy constructor, assignment operator, and so on. Uh, notice that I have an insert that takes an iterator and T. And you say, that doesn't make sense because the container decides where it goes. It's going to go in that sorted order. So why am I giving it an iterator? And the answer is you don't have to. But if you do, the container treats that as a hint. So it starts its depth first search at that iterator value, or in the range near that iterator value, okay, and uh, might not find it because your hint might not be accurate, you know, and so then it, so it's a mild optimization thing. I think you would discover that 50% uh, of the time you couldn't measure the difference, and in the remaining 50%, 30% of the time the hint was good and you got slightly better performance. And uh, the other 20% of the time, it wasn't good, and he got slightly worse performance. Okay, so I don't use it. You can use the hints if you want to, but that's why they're there. You know, again, if you were designing a CAD system or something like that, you might, you know, something with thousands and thousands and thousands of elements being stored, you might reconsider that. I can erase a range from iterator one to iterator two. Um, so. So uh, notice that lower bounds and upper bounds are really designed for uh, multi sets and multi maps and unordered multi-sets and unordered multi-maps. That key now returns a range of things. <coughs> and this gives you the bounds on the ranges. <coughs> STL iterators. So what I've done is <coughs> provide the interfaces for these iterators. The iterators all have the interface, some subset of the interface of the standard C++ pointer, the native pointer. But a forward iterator won't have I minus minus, okay? So you don't get the backup stuff on an iterator that can't back up. And uh, if you're in a uh, container of linked elements like a list, uh, it's not going to give you uh, iterator plus n. Won't be defined in the interface. So, but other than that, it's just a normal pointer interface. Everything is business as usual. So if you combine, you understand what native pointers do, and then you combine that with knowledge of how that container has to work, then you know exactly what the interface is. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, Here's a list of the algorithms as of, I don't know, probably 2012 or something. Uh, there might be a few more now. You know, uh, every um, re-standardization of the language may introduce a few. And uh, even before language becomes standard, like uh, uh, C++ 17, is still a work in progress. C++ 20 is a work in really big progress, you know. Uh, 
But um, a lot of the compiler vendors are including stuff from, uh, from those standards to come. Uh, the standard committees, the way they work is uh, when they're thinking about uh, including some functionality, they write a technical report. And the idea of the technical report is it proposes, here's how we do it, and it writes code to show that, in fact, it can be done. And then the committee uh, looks at it for a long time, trying to, trying to answer the question, will this break existing code? And sometimes they'll adopt it even though they know it will, but they do that with great reluctance. They try really hard not to break existing code. But an idea may be so good, so obviously needed, that they would elect to break some existing code. But what that means is that they'll provide compiler switches that let you go back, you know, compile against the older version where it should work. Um, but anyway, so the compiler vendors may well uh, have, you know, be adding stuff that isn't part of the current C++11 standard. Uh, 14 is a done deed, but I don't know whether it actually is. I know Visual Studio hasn't fully implemented 14. Uh, I think C++, I think GCC and Clang have both implemented the complete C++14. But in any case, there uh, probably are a few things that might, you know, that I haven't included on my list. I stole this list out of Stephen Prada, C++ Primer Plus. Uh, Stephen Prada, that book is a nice programming book. He's got, he, it's big, big, thick book. He's got tons of code frag, you know, code examples and code fragments, really showing you, here's how you write this, but no design. No, you know, no design. It's just programming. So if you understand that, I, I own a copy. I really don't look at it much at all anymore. I write so much C++ code, I don't need to. But, you know, uh, there were years when I was using it fairly regularly. Okay. Not, a, not a bad. And, you know, I'm sure you'll find a, almost any book you'll find PDF, free PDF version floating, you know. It's too bad because not so many good books are written anymore because there's no payoff. Where's the payoff? You know, the only guys who write technical books now are, are crazy people. When I retire, I got a book or two in me, okay? Crazy people, knowing you won't get anything like the compensation for it that it, you know, it takes in terms of effort. Uh, but the, mostly the people who write books are consultants who are building their reputation so that they get lots of job opportunities, okay? But anyway, um, so, you know, this is just a description. So you can look. The idea here is this is just a quick list you can scan down. I need, a, I, I, I want to do this thing. And there's lots of, scan down the list, and you got a pretty good idea what you can do. Okay? That's the whole idea. That's why this is here. And again, you know, if we go back to this, uh, I have a few little tiny code snippets, but not many. I don't know why I put them in, because it's nothing like uniform. It's just usually something I wasn't sure about, so I do a little example just to convince myself that, that, was, that it did work that way. Um, but if you go back here to the containers reference, and especially to the algorithms reference, uh, you know, there's a really nice list here, a, uh, some conversation like I had. But the nice thing about this is you can click on it, and you'll almost always find more detail and an example. So this is a really good place, you know, when you're thinking about maybe using, this is what I use this site for a lot. When you're thinking about using an algorithm, great place to find. Here's all the algorithms. Here's what they do. Is this the right one for me? Here's a code example. So I tried it, and it isn't, well, why isn't this working? You go back and look at the example in detail, and they say, oh, yeah. I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I didn't do the other thing. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> what we're going to do next time, we're just about out of time, 
So what we're going to do next time is I'm going to talk about the STL details and odds and ends. Uh, no, th that, this is what we were just looking at. I'm going to talk about STL odds and ends. There's a couple of things that are kind of quirky. Uh, the syntax is unexpected. Why do I do this thing? Why do I erase differently in this container than I do in that container? You know, they both have erase functions, but, you know, so we'll look at that a little bit. Uh, this came largely from a really nice book by uh, Scott Myers. Uh, Scott Myers. Any book that Scott Myers wrote, you want to look at. He's got a beautiful book called, a uh, new one called uh, Modern C++. And he's really talking about the C++ 11 through 17. And there's a lot of really interesting things. For example, uh, the containers that have push back and push front also have in place back and in place front. If they have an insert, they also have an in, pl in place, in place for the insert. And the idea is that it avoids a potential copy, extra copy. So if I say in a vector of ints, push back three. Now, if I, let's make a more reasonable example. If I uh, push back in a vector of strings, quote a string, what happens is that literal string is constructed, a, a real string is constructed from that literal string and then copied into the container. What in place does is instead of constructing a temporary and copying it, it constructs it at that site where it's going to go. So it avoids an extra a copy, just does the, the one construction that has to happen. So uh, the moral of the story is that in place is faster, more efficient, if you're doing a type conversion. If you're not, it's not. And there's a couple of places where it might actually be disadvantage, uh, disadvantageous to do it. Very tiny, narrow possible conditions. The STL designers wanted to make in place always at least as good as push back and push front and insert. And they almost got there, but not quite. And Scott Myers tells you why and tells you exactly when that'll happen. So that's the kind of thing that he does in his beautiful book. So should you run out and buy it? No. But if you find yourself working in a job as a C++ developer, don't walk, run to the a uh, nearest uh, Amazon <laughs> portal and buy a copy. Okay. All righty, with that, uh, the no help session tomorrow. I'm doing my taxes. Uh, so, and on Tuesday, we'll finish up this and begin to get ready for template metaprogramming. Would you believe the semester is almost over? Doesn't it break your heart? The semester's almost over. I can't stand it. Oh, I'm so unhappy that the semester. Oh my God, thank God. This torture, there is an end to this torture. There is. <laughs> okay. See you all on Tuesday. Bye, Gabe. Hi. Hi. I had a question actually. Sure. Well, um, design patterns, is that offered both semesters next year or is that just a fall? Say this again? Like design patterns? Is that no, that's only a fall. And um, I'm retiring in the end of the spring in 19, 2019. I don't know that it'll, if it'll ever be taught again. I don't know. I hope it will. I really want it to be, but I don't know. So I don't know. Uh, it's not. So you can get in. Yeah. The problem is, is for some reason they left, you know, 15 spots for PhD candidates reserved for PhD. So you, uh, in fact, if you could stick around, we'll go and talk to Rebecca and we'll get you in. Okay, that'd be great. Yep. Thank you.
The design patterns book is the only one. There is a head first design patterns book, but the problem, it's a, a nice, well written book uh, okay. with really clear explanations. The problem is that it isn't complete. There's a lot of the patterns they don't talk about. Okay. So, uh, you know, if you and your friend are taking it, you know, one of you buy one, one of you buy the other, or one of you get the PDF for one, one of you get for whatever you do. Okay. I think I have got this before.